Hi everybody, thank you for staying for the end of this very long and jam-packed day. My name is Cindy Cohen and I'm the legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and I think my microphone just went out, yeah? Yeah. I think like Ryan, I'm a little bit more of a, uh, we've had a lot of big thoughts and, and, and large uh, um, ideas presented to us today from a, a, a range of really amazing speakers. I don't know about you guys, but I can't listen to Evan Moglin without getting a little chill. Um, I am in the trenches on these things. In fact, I was counting the number of clients in the FF that flashed up Ryan's slides, and I, I lost track after about 15. Um, we're the people who, at least right now, are trying to do as much as we can in the digital space to make room for all of the great commons-based ideas that uh, we've been talking about over the course of the day. And I think that being in the trenches, I, I wanted to share with you a couple of the conclusions that I have about how we can continue to build and foster a strong commons in, in, in the space that I'm most familiar with, which is the online world. Um, and I, I guess it, it really kind of all boils down to, to one line, which is, um, it's the intermediary, stupid. Um, how we treat the intermediaries who host our speech and who host the kinds of um, spaces that we create in the digital world for discussion, um, what kind of laws we put on them and what kind of technologies we let them use or prevent them from using or limit them in their ways of innovation is going to, I think, in a very fundamental way dictate what kind of a commons and whether we have a, you know, anything that can be honestly called a commons at all in the digital world. Um, and I want to talk about a, a couple of different examples to kind of highlight what it is. There's a, there's a set of legal examples um, about how we treat intermediaries. And then I think there are also some questions that are, are what, you know, what, what we talk about as you know, code as law kind of examples of how we can create and foster our commons or not, depending on how we decide to treat things. The legal ones are the ones where I get, um, the, well, I get involved on both sides of these, but the ones that I, I, I want to talk about first, since we are fundamentally the, a, 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 a legal group here. Um, and when you look across the range of the law and start asking the question from the, from the viewpoint of, okay, how are we treating the people who host the speech that other people are making online, you can begin to see where we're fostering freedom and where we're not. So let's think about claims like, um, uh, claims having to do with copyright. Well, in the copyright era, era what we have is a, is a, is a regime that was set up by the Digital Millennium Copyright Act that has no decent takedown, right? So if you think somebody else who's speaking out there in the digital world is using your copyright, all you have to do is send a little notice, it has to have some formulaic things, to the host of the speech, not to the speaker, to the host of the speech, and the host of the speech will take that speech down. Censorship upon notice is what we have in the copyright regime. Now we have a put back provision, and we also have a provision in the law that allows there to be a, a lawsuit if, if you take somebody's speech down wrongfully. Those are both good things, and EFF uses them a lot. But if you think about what that means for virtue of a of creation of a place where people can speak freely, it's a very low trigger for taking down speech. And how do we how does that actually work? Well, if you've seen in the news in the last couple of weeks, you've seen that Warner Music is in a fight with YouTube about how much money they should get out of other people's work that's hosted on YouTube that uses Warner Music. And as a result of being mad at, at YouTube, Warner decided to take down everything on YouTube that used any of Warner's music. And so we saw guys who were taking videos of Warner Music and doing American Sign Language versions of it so people with cochlear implants and hearing problems could understand what the words are in popular songs. They all came down. We saw a range of people who were taking, who were showing people over the internet how to play guitar, how to play guitar solos of some of the songs that they like. Instruction videos all taken down. All sorts of things that are plainly and obviously with almost no, plainly and obviously fair use or good fair use places that we ought to actually be able to take up and litigate, taken down, because this is a low level notice. Let's look about some other areas of the law. Let's look at like defamation. If you think somebody has defamed you in a, in, on, a, on a news group or in a method group, well there we have a very high level of protection for our intermediaries. We have something called CDA 230, um, which is a, a, a part of a law called the Communications Decency Act that was very famous at the beginning of the internet for being thrown out by the Supreme Court and all cheered. There was another piece of it called 
CDA Section 230, that creates very broad immunity for hosted speech for what other people say. And what do we see as a result of CDA 230? We see Craigslist. We see all of the internet forums. We see any place where anybody can speak freely on the, on the internet, can say what they want, and why can people host what, where people can say what they want? Because CDA 230 protects the host. Because otherwise it's the weak link. And they go down. So in the, in, in the areas outside of intellectual property law and criminal law, federal criminal law, we see a lot of free speech going on. Uh, and that's because we treat the intermediaries as if they are what they ought to be, which is the mere conduit issue. The phone company isn't liable if you make a, if you make a crank, crank, crank phone call over the phone line. And Craigslist isn't liable if you say something ugly on Craigslist. And because of both of those two protections, we have phones and we have Craigslist. Straight as that. Um, there are efforts right now to try to pull some of this stuff down, and some of them are well-meaning because some of the things that people do on Craigslist hurt people. But I think that we have to pay attention to what kind of comments we're going to have if we make the inter intermediaries liable. Um, the third area where we're starting to see, where we see the, another area where we see things is the questions having to do with trade secrets. Trade secrecy law. There are, is no protection, at least right now. There's a fight right now about it, but generally. There is no protection, and the no, the no protection goes up. So what happened in the co in the context of the case called WikiLeaks? Are you guys familiar with the WikiLeaks case? WikiLeaks is a wiki where people can leak things. It's well named. Um, and there was some insider information about a bank, uh, a Swiss bank called Bank Julius Baer, that was posted on WikiLeaks. And what did the bank do? It's curious to watch. The bank didn't go to WikiLeaks and say, take this down. The bank didn't even go to the ISP and said, take this down. The bank went to the domain name host and said, there's illegal stuff on with you, you have to take it down. And a well-meaning but misguided federal judge in San Francisco ordered WikiLeaks to be taken down. The whole website went dark as a result of this. Now, EFF, ACLU, a whole bunch of people were charging into the cavalry. And we got the judge to understand that it's not OK to turn out the lights all the way up here on the chain because of something that somebody did all the way down here on the chain. But I think that what happened to WikiLeaks and the reason that the way that we had to rally to its defense demonstrates that the internet isn't a thing where you have one place and that's all you have to go to. Everybody who's active on the internet stands on the shoulders of someone who's standing on the shoulders of someone who stands on the shoulders of someone else. And unless you protect the chain all the way down, you're going to have problems keeping and maintaining an open conference where people can speak freely because People further down the chain, they don't have the political will or the moral strength to be able to host, to say uh, that they're going to protect the speech as much as the people who are actually doing the speaking. Um, so those are kind of three areas of law. We can talk about a couple others, but I know that our time is short here today, and everybody wants to get to have drinks. Um, so as we look across the thing, where do we see you know, good hosts, places where speech is being, is being fostered well? Um, well, I think there's a good, for all the coders here, of course, there's things like SourceForge, which is a place that hosts a lot of open source products, uh, projects. SourceForge, SourceForge has been remarkably resilient at withstanding efforts to try to take down projects. Um, sometimes they take down projects, sometimes they don't. My friends from Rise Up are here, and they are one of my best examples of uh, a, a community-based organization that tries to foster places where people can speak freely and, and, and long may they wait. Um, there are some bad intermediaries out there as well. Um, right now I'm suing one. It's AT&T. Uh, their involvement in the warrantless wiretapping of the NSA. An intermediary who takes all your data and hands it over to the government without a warrant, it's a bad intermediary. And it's as important to protect, to, to create law and code that protects, the, that fosters the intermediary's ability to create speech as it is to create both law and code that require the intermediary to protect their end users in a way that they do not. Um, network neutrality debate is all about the concern that people have that intermediaries, the people who, who host, uh, who, who run, the, who hold the wires, the, the duopoly of Verizon and AT&T that, that, that are the backbone for a lot of the internet, will start to act in a discriminatory nature. And it's the same kind of fight. Are we going to make sure that our inter intermediaries are working in a way that's neutral and is on our side? Or are we going to let them make decisions for themselves about whose content gets favored over which content? And this is the debate that's going on right now. 
Um, I think it's important to the question of what we're going to do is who's going to have the power to decide uh, what they get to do and what they don't get to do in the network neutrality debate. And then there are intermediaries who I think it's fair to say are worrying at best. And top of my list on that right now is Google. Because Google is interesting. They're a pretty neutral intermediary, but they're being an intermediary basically in a way that makes a bargain with you. And the bargain with you is what I call the surveillance business model. And Evan talked about this a lot earlier today as well, which is let us watch everything you do, keep track of it, and try to sell you, try to introduce you to marketers who will sell you stuff based upon what you do in exchange for us being a good neutral intermediary. And there are a lot of people willing to take that deal. Uh, and there are, I think, an increasing number of us who are, who are a bit worried about that deal. And I think we all ought to be especially worried about this deal and watch closely about how Google does, does this. It's a different sort of fight than like AT&T, right? AT&T is just being bad, right? They're just handing over your data to the NSA. Google's actually making a financial transaction with people that is troubling, I think, um, but, but, but in a kind of a different category. Um, but the thing to watch for this is what happens with the Google Print settlement. You, so Google Print is a project by Google that's scanning all of the world's books. They were sued by the publishers saying, you can't scan our books. Um, Google said, yes, we can. We think it's fair use. And there was a little bit of a fight. And ultimately, Google, a fight that we really wanted them to win and take up and join. But ultimately, Google decided to settle the case. And they settled the case in a way in which they're going to get to scan all the world's books in exchange for giving a piece to the publisher. But they're going to have to track what we read. And they're going to have to report to the publishers what we read. <coughs> and they're going to have to, in order to divide up the money, in order to sell us books, and frankly, in some ways that we don't yet know. Um, but once Google knows everything you search on and every place you go on the internet, and now they just announced that AdSense, which is their program that places ads on most of the websites you see, you are going to literally spend, I think, most of every single day online nowhere in a place that's not being tracked by Google in one way or another. And I think that represents a sea change that we all now need to stop and think about. Um, and what kind of restrictions do we want to make? How long is Google going to keep this data? How much do they have? And what are they going to use it for? And how are they going to be able to cross purposes? It, I think are questions that are not only questions about what ought to be happened in between this particular lawsuit between Google and the publishers, but I think it's something where we all need to have a say. What kind of a deal do we want to have about our reading habits? in the digital age? And do we want to make that same surveillance deal for books that many of us have made for our email? If you use Gmail, Google read your mail. They don't read it as they keep it. They run an algorithm through it to be able to show you the different ad. They don't actually keep that data just yet. Um, how, what's, what is the deal that we want to make for this intermediary, which is increasingly providing a whole bunch of services and this is one where I have to say, I don't know that I know exactly what the answer is. I know what troubles me, and there's clearly some stuff that's easy to be opposed to. But overall, Google's doing something a little different than a lot of other intermediaries. And I think it's time that we start thinking about the deal that Google's offering us. And other people are offering us this as well. I don't mean to just demonize Google, but Google is the biggest, and they're going to have, they already have, and are going to continue to have the most data about it. So they're a good one to start with, at least in thinking about it. So that's one that I think is, is kind of troubling. I think Facebook is another. Facebook is also making the same deal with you that Google's making, which is tell us who your friends are. Let us host your communications with all your friends. Um, in exchange for that, we'll, you know, we'll do that for you for free. In exchange, we'll, we'll serve you ads and maybe later figure out some other business model to, to utilize the data we have. These are the kinds of, I think, harder questions that we have to ask ourselves as we're moving forward and thinking about how to create and foster comments. It's because Facebook has created a kind of a comments that a lot of people really like and use and find utility in. Google has created a lot of products that people like and really want to use. And I think we have to start thinking about what, not only just about what kind of things we want to say, yes, you can do, and no, you can't do, but what kind of transactions do we want to have with the kind of companies that are creating our comments? 
What kind of requirements do we want to place on them? What kind of limitations do we want to place on them? And what kind of immunities do we want to give them? Because it's the immunity, it's the intermediary, stupid. And if we don't treat them right, we don't have a comments at all. Thank you.